And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Valley of the Judged, a subsidiary of the monastery, the open bar of the internet, and someone's phone is buzzing. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with and with me I have two of I have two of my good brothers, and the third one is once again is once again late and gay. We ha in the red corner we ha we have Mr. Yeetus Deletus this week. <laughs> Good brother Ash, and in the blue corner we have the bane of my fucking existence. Good brother Xanatrix. And today we're t and today we've got something a little different in our le in our level up five E series. But first, how the fuck you two doing? Ah, uh, doing all right. Doing all right. I'm just hoping that I don't become a lightning rod inside my house. If I wanted to get hit by lightning, I'd go outside. Um, well, you're not drawing your sword on holy ground, so I don't think you have to worry too much. I mean, that's true. Um, but <laughs> this, up until this week, we've covered familiar classes, or, or familiar mechanics, that have had, had presence in one form or another throughout previous editions. Um, this week, we have something that is going to be a little different. For one, we have, we... We don't have to do a whole lot of speculation on some parts because we have 20 levels to work with and three subclasses, along with the other knickknacks we've come we've come to expect throughout the, throughout our adventures with this series. Because this week we are dealing with the Warlord, the cl the class that pe that people have been clamoring to, to see brought back in some form or another. Into into fifth edition, and it looks like En World has decided to do what what um, Crawford won't. Then again, he did. He, then again, Ash didn't he make that remark about leaving about leaving a space blank so that players could come up with it? I can't remember the, when the last time they've said that was. I think they've. I think that phrase is largely dropped off the face of the earth. Good riddance. Probably because it was a really dumb thing to say. <laughs> yeah, they they figured out it just made people angrier. Well, it made you angry. Uh, it certainly did. Mm -hmm. So, the tricky thing with addressing the warlord is that it doesn't have a very long lineage. The earliest incarnation of this idea, the idea, the core tenet of the warrior is the is essentially the essentially the battle leader, the D fighter. The oh, I'm sorry. Was that not? No. Was that no? No. Hmm. Mm. Not. Not really. Okay. Um, the earliest incarnation of the warlord was the marshal in the third in third edition D and D, which a lot of people ended up missing out on because it wasn't in a D and D splat book per se. It was in the fucking miniatures handbook. And granted, it, in the excerpts for the thing, it was made free. But the point is, it wasn't in a spot that people would actually look for it. Good job, Watsy. I feel that's necessary this time. Besides, who the hell is gonna? Who, if someone's picking up a miniatures game, they don't. They they're not really expecting any degree of um crossover. Ah. Like, I mean, it, when it ha when it happens, it, when it happens, it's nice. But you're pick. But if you're picking up a miniatures handbook, you're probably gonna be using it for miniature wargaming. Not ri Not really for. Not re not really for expansions to an associated RPG rule set. Then again, I will. Then again, I was of the mindset that it was that they should there should have been at least one prestige class in the player's handbook, even if it even if it meant taking away a few pages of spells. Because let's face it, third edition and Pathfinder have too many pages of spells as it is. A lot of them are a lot of them are slight variants of each other. Um. But the uh, the idea the I, the idea is the is the lead from the front kind of kind of captain. Um, 
I've seen, I've seen, I have seen the argument that that's what happens with the fighter because he gets followers at a certain level. The problem is the um, that whole end, that whole end game part where where you're where you're effectively having station in in AD and D first and first and second even. It wasn't all that fleshed out. Mm. Um, like you, you would get, you would get, it would talk about you getting followers or getting a holding, but, but through, but unless you had a certain splat, the details as far as as far as the holding and how, and and how to utilize followers and the kind of adventuring once you're in that once you're in a position where it's more efficient to stay put wasn't really explored. I honestly think Axe does a better job of exploring that particular endgame. And it's there, it's just undercooked. It depends on whether or not you're using Chainmail. And of course, Axe basically taking it and saying, oh, well, we'll just put our version of Chainmail in the core rules, uh, makes that convenient. I can't u I can't use that I can't use that particular line of line of thinking because that would violate my own rules. The whole the whole self containment thing. Um, I don't I don't know what your particular rule on that is, so I can't. I pref I pre for me for me it for me it's a case of if I if I have to if I have to if I have to if I had to reference chainmail in the, in this particular instance in order to in order to in order to better exp in order to better explain a rule that's in the rule book um that's an that's not something i can go with because it because it's not because it's not in the rule book that i that i am suppo that I'm supposed to be having um i see what you mean it's I li I liken it to when um when I used when I used to write movie reviews and people would say say that this or that plot hole in the film was 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 explained in the book and I'm like I sh I shouldn't ha I it should all be in it if it do if I need to read if I need supplementary material to make se to make sense of what I watched that's a problem unless of course it's Yoko Taro um that's a whole that's a whole I, which... other Probably doesn't make for. I don't want to rails this, but that's probably not the best. I'm just just gonna give voice to what people are undoubtedly thinking. It's like that's probably not the best comparison if you think of Chainmail as being a core book of AD and D. I think the folks back then did think, of, or the people who were trying to play it as written were along that line of thought. But who knows? Mm -hmm. And. And it's for, I'm not even sure. By the time AD and D second was out, I'm not even sure if Chainmail was still in print. I'd have to, I'd have to double check, but I kind of doubt it. That is a good question. And if it was if it wasn't in print, then that then that's all. Then that brings further problems. So no, the third edition of Chainmail was in print because I have that. That's uh, that was in print in 1975. And second edition came out when? Um, was that in the nineties? Eighties. Eighties. Okay, I think it might have still been in print then. I'm not sure. It could have, but it, it 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 was probably it was probably a long shot, and unfortunately, I can't find I can't find out when something went out went out of print. I can only I can only find when something came out. Right. Um, now getting back to the, getting back to the marshal, um, the mar the marshal was the marshal for for trying to be a front for trying to be a frontline commander for whatever reason its base attack bonus was on the low end right alongside rogues and clerics and they had a d8 for a hit die so not exactly as frontline as they probably should have been. Um, their main claim to fame were were their, were getting auras, which could grant circumstance bonuses to allies within sixty feet of you as long as they're conscious, mob, mobile, and um, audible. Uh, most of them were bonuses to checks, um, but th but they but those bonuses could be sw could be swapped freely as far as the minor auras. Minor auras, major ones were far more sweeping that could grant. Modifiers to stuff like attack rolls, AC, or movement speed. 
Um, it was it was okay. I'd say, I'd say it. I'd say if I were to put it in the tier system, it would probably be like tier three. Um, but the big the big pro the big problem is that a lot of what it could do could is outstripped by just a divine caster using buffing spells, especially since there especially since there wasn't that concentration bullshit back then. <laughs> um. The only way you could really make it work was by thro was by throwing in so throwing in some of the stuff from dragon magic, which brought in draconic auras. Granted, it brought in as a feat, but you could still theoretically use it. The big the bigger problem, the because of the because it was in the miniatures handbook, it much like it's uh, much like the other um, class that was in there, the war mage, they didn't get a whole lot of support. Oh. I can see that happening, especially considering that the miniatures handbook would have probably sold a lot less than other splat books around that time. Mm -hmm. Um, plus, if now I'm if my timeline is correct, the miniatures handbook was still in the 3.0 days, not necessarily the 3.5 days. And yeah. as we as so we've the... go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say there's going to be a small small amount of uh, semi conversion needed from three to three five. Yeah, especially since we've established that a lot of the a lot of the entries in three in three point oh itself were a case of an idea of what they were doing, but ne but clearly needed some refinement. Mm -hmm. Now that said, there were two um there were two there were two non Watsy D twenty D twenty games that did take the uh, did take the idea and do their own spin with it. Um, the first one that I want that I want to talk about is the captain base class from Fantasy Craft. Now, admittedly, compare com even though they both use the D twenty system, comparing Fantasy Craft to D and D third edition is is very very night and day. Um. I've speak I've spoken out of my love for Fantasy Craft for how, for how modular it is, but the only thing that they really have in common is just a set of familiar stats and using um a d20 as the as the die roll. But um the core but the core ability that they ha that they had was cadre where once per scene is a free action you could grant your teammates one of your basic combat feats until the end of the scene, which, could, which um, depending on what feats you chose, I can see that getting use. Um, you'd also start with the personal lieutenant feat, and basic combat feats count as count as style feats for for their for um for the lieutenant's XP value. Its main thing that it would get was ma was a series of features called Master and Commander, um, which would grant which would grant um, terrain feat and increase the maximum um, skill ranks that they could have for tactics. Um, they would also gain a, se a set of features called Battle Plans. In fact, that. By the time they're at level, by the time they're at the top, they'd get they'd get um um f a to a a total of six with each of them getting a plus four bonus. Um, battle planning is essentially the aura set is the aura setup. Um, trying to see where the Every cl every class in Fantasy Craft has what's referred to as a game breaker feature at level fourteen. In their case, it w it was the fact that that personal lieutenant they get at the start has their threat level increased to your own career level minus one, and you can use up to two battle plans at the same time when your lieutenant can see and hear you. So, effectively, with the captain, you're you, you're utilizing to, you're utilizing a main and a and a sub character at the same time, along with along with the whole or along with the whole auras and utilizing the feat system that Fantasy Craft has, which is a rabbit hole I don't feel like going down. But I can but I've made it clear I find it infinitely better than a lot of other games' attempt at using feats. 
mostly because it's properly organized, so you don't have to list which is a bonus feed and which isn't. Mm -hmm. That, and you don't have to deal with the whole chain shit that um, 3rd Edition did. Um, yeah, where you just have to get a feat to get the next feat to get the next feat until finally you're effective. Mm -hmm. Um... 13th Age, now this what 13th Age had their own answer in the in one of the main expansions I, rec I recommended in my review called um, The Commander. And commanders were de were definitely in were definitely in the same vein and I, and I remember I uh, I asked you Zan to look to look into the 13th Age classes when we did that Monster Hunter experiment. Um yep. What was what was your take on the whole commands and tactics approach that um, the commander had? Um, I didn't dive into them too deeply, only because of the fact that I was focused on getting the classes that actually uh, applied to any of the weapons. Mm -hmm. So, when I looked at the commander and saw, oh, this is a, C this is a battlefield CC, not unlike, you know, uh, things I've seen in other games, I, uh, I kind of glossed over it, so I don't have too strong an opinion regarding that. Yep. Um, the commander in Thirteenth Age would have a pool known as command points. These were at will for uh, for their particular commands and tactics, which were um, at will at will powers, usually limited to once per round as a interrupt. Um, you'd start you'd start each battle with one command point and and gain more from f from the two command features fight from the front and weigh the odds with fight from the front whenever you'd hit a melee attack during the turn you'd gain 1d3 command points or you could spend a standard action to gain 1d4 command points um and when it com when it comes to the difference between the difference between commands and tactics is that commands are all interrupts Whereas, te whereas um, tactics were were either were either um were one were either um were one were um single use actions one, that you could you could recharge. Some of them were once per round. Some of them had um, more specific um, requirements, like say just say calm, where you could only use it when the escalation die is at least two or higher, and the ones that you could only use one. Um, once per once per battle, you could get a recharge check after battles. Um, so it's basically a it's basically a case of the qu of the quicker stuff or the more or the more powerful complex stuff. Um, which I thought I thought was an I thought was a nice little um, balancing act that could be done. And obviously, there's still things like the talent system that Thirteenth Age has. Yeah. Um. Now then, of course, we do have the Warlord, which is from which started out in Fourth Edition, and um, again, the all of these are are these are meant to represent command command archetypes, whether that be the t whether that be the tactical genius or the charismatic boss, or or the or, or the army grognard. Um, Army Grognard, you're going to do it this way and you're going to like it, but mm -hmm. sir, we haven't fought in ranks for 300 years. Um, the adage that's often used with the Warlord is, a Barbarian hits you with his axe, a Warlord hits you with his Barbarian. Yes. Because a, a, lot of, a lot of the powers that they would have would... Instead, instead of instead of doing things like buffing, it would be more it would be more about granting um, extra opportunities for actions to your allies. And while so some people made some dumb arguments, like what what if my PC doesn't want to take orders from it, from anybody, which is a which again is a dumb argument to. To make in this particular case, um, and when Fifth Edition came around, the Warlord was no was nowhere to be seen. And a, an argument that I've seen off and on is that the Battlemaster Fighter subtype 
essentially is the warlord. And I don't I don't agree. The it may have that may have been the intention at first, but the the battlemaster as it as it currently is is can is kind of become the maneuver based fighter. For people who want for people who want a pool of maneuvers and um, and complexities within their fighter instead instead of the more simplistic crit fishy approach of say the champion. Is I think there I think there were a few a, a few support centric maneuvers early on, but it but um that didn't last. And ultimately the ultimately the problem with trying to with trying to make the battlemaster into the 5e answer to the warlord is it's st it's still a, it's still a fighter and it's still going to be playing mostly like a fighter. And while warlords are certainly a martial class, they're not exactly fighters in the same sense. But that br that brings us to the l to the latest um entry in our in our look at the level up play test, the war the warlord. Which which as mentioned before, we have 20 levels wor levels worth to c to cover. So but I think I think we sh I think we should we should address one little qu one little question first. Um do you guys do, an argument that I've seen is that the is that the idea of a warlord is some is something that's better served as an NPC class or is not distinctive enough to be separate from a fighter. I don't agree with that personally, but what but what do you guys think? Sam, I'll let you go first. You go. Okay. Um. The. The warlord is definitely more distinct than just an NPC commanding other NPCs. Um, it's definitely given a lot of ability to assist and uh, elevate other players, as well as any allies or, in this case, followers that they have, and also to hinder the enemy. Mm -hmm. um, and it does so in a way that no other class uh, has a skill set similar to, um, it, which gives it a unique flavor. The argument that this is just not distinct enough to be an NPC or not distinct enough and must be an NPC, to rephrase, excuse me, mm -hmm. uh, is it's it's a, a shallow assessment, one made without taking the time to look at what a warlord can do. Hmm. All right. Uh, Sam, was that all you had to say? or? Yeah, that's that's all I had to say in general about I that. Did, I didn't want to argument. go off. I didn't know if you were thinking or not. No, uh, that, that that was the conclusion. I should probably say this is the end and start turning into you. It, ha it happens, it happens. At, <laughs> at the very least, I tend to take those pauses, and they will be occasionally quite long. In regards to the... For I mean, f developing Lords of Brackus is a reason why I did not include a fighter and did include a warlord. It's because I think the warlord is the more appropriate... I think the warlord is expressive... Thematically, at the very least, it might not be in any given mechanical sense, depending on which game you're playing, but thematically, the Warlord is tied into a game in which the RPG is the zoomed-in scale between sessions or between activities which deal with the wider domain scale, which deal with the wider state of the world, which deal with, like, mass combat and building strongholds and dealing with armies and you know your your armies are out there fighting somewhere and you're the reason you're at this dungeon is because it's a vital choke point or there's an artifact that you're going to need in order to 
get past the giant wall that's been erected in your path. Things of that variety. And that, to me, is far more interesting. I wish RPGs had taken that route, as opposed to only focusing in on the the zoomed-in day-to-day. So I think, the, I think the Warlord is emblematic of not just something that shouldn't be relegated to an NPC class, but something that ought to be the focus of the game. I also think it's quite telling that um, one of one of the more in, one of one of the most enduring um, narrative one of the most enduring character tropes throughout fiction in general and fantasy fiction specifically is the chess master, whether a heroic chess master or a villainous chess master. And I do think it's inevitable that somebody will want to pl- will want to play that particular archetype in in some manner whether it be whether it be the whether it be the charismatic squad leader or the um or the or the guy who who or the guy in a lot of st- in a lot of fiction who muscles his way into into beca- into becoming a leader through she- through sheer force of will um well, let's or- be real here everybody wants to be a xanatos um when the f- the two the two primary builds when the warlord first came out in um, fourth edition was the tactical and the bralva um, warlord and bec- and the j- the joke at the time was that you were either playing the kamina warlord or the lelouch warlord and lelouch is basically xanatos in mecha with a magic eye, <laughs> but the and the and hell the the game that the game that helped br- the game that helped bring back um bring back fu- in fu- in a f- in several of the more recent fire emblems you're playing as essentially the stra- the strategist of your group. I think in Awakening that's literally what you were. I think so. Yeah, Robin was. Yeah, Robin's Robin's um, class at, in that was. Um, I think it was. I think the technical term was tactician. But regardless, it it was that was the, that was the that was the approach. Um, yep. And that's not the that's not the only example of of this kind of thing. That's just that's just a major one. And for me, at least, I've I know I, I know I've considered making characters that are slight nods to Zhuge Liang at least once. The man who will kill you with a letter. <laughs> ah, the man who wields fans in the Dynasty Warrior games. Yes. And who will write you <laughs> such a letter that you might die. Ah. Uh... Not entirely sure what would be what would be in that letter, but it's probably best not to know. <laughs> Super anthrax. He was a he was a an ancient an ancient version of a of a modern day letter bomber. <laughs> that is terrible. Uh... But. When it comes to the when it comes to the fi- when it comes to the five E um, warlord, um, there's a f- there's a few things that I find interesting. One, a D10 hit die, which honest honestly is the honestly I think is appropriate. Um, having n- having no tool proficiencies, which is he doesn't need to use the tools. He just tells the other people around him to use the tools. Mm-hmm. And now, as far as the, as far as the skill layout, that's exactly what we what we would have thought. Mm-hmm. Um, but the first feature, the first class feature that we have is commanding presence, which starts out as a ten foot radius and go and goes goes up goes up to twenty feet at fifth level, um, thirty feet at ninth level. 15, 45 feet at 15th level and 60 feet as the as a capstone and the 
the when it, when you take an attack action, you can forgo making one attack to allow a friendly creature within range of your commanding presence to make an attack instead. If the target can hear you, it can use its reaction to either cast a cantrip or make one weapon attack. I can see this being sem I can see this being semi useful um er early game and by late game when you have the opportunity to have multiple attacks. I can see this being a whole lot more useful. Yeah, once they hit fifth level and get extra attack, uh, you can forego. You could forego one attack and have your ally set up, you know, using a cantrip or a weapon attack, and then you come in with a with a second attack right after. Mm -hmm. Um, can I just say though this uh this commanding presence? This sounds awfully familiar. Where have I seen this? Four. Oh yeah, HQ units in uh, Super Robot Wars. Those uh, commander fields that raise all your two hit and damage. Mm -hmm. So oh. I, I I immediately see a lot of potential to use that. Yep. Um, rallying surge is is de is decent but i don't think i don't think it's going to be as useful as commanding presence because you're essentially doing a bon you're doing a bonus action with a long rest and once again we once again it rears the ugly head of of the whole short rest long rest issues that we have no. um but the fact that the fact that Adam, I I think I I think it'd be a little cooler with rallying surge if it did if it did more than just one d if if it did more than just one d eight plus your level. I mean, it's it's free healing as a bonus action, mm -hmm. and you're able to target multiple people at at a very early level. Yeah, I I see it. I see it getting a lot of use early. Mm -hmm. um, later levels, I see it getting maybe clutch uses, but not as many uses as it would have gotten early levels, simply because at those higher levels, the amount of healing isn't even enough to stave off one blow from the types of enemies that you're going to be seeing at those at those times. Well, I think that's when people would be using it for the entirety of their career, for lack of a better term, as a warlord. Yeah, but I'm... I'm like, would you just pop this as a bonus just kind of spontaneously, or would you probably use this uh, once one of your allies got knocked down? I, I, I do see the point, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, even, w even with that, the... F the um the idea of the idea of using it as an emergency as an emergency button at higher levels i th i think i'd be a i think i'd be a little cooler with it if the if at if say once you're in the teens it's at 2d8 i don't know i see like the i believe the intent of the Ability is quite clearly just to get somebody back up mm -hmm. on your turn without having to expend any other important aspects of your action economy. Yeah. Now, when it comes to combat maneuvers, we've are, we've already we've already talked a good, we've already talked a good deal about that, and it doesn't look it doesn't look like there are any new um, trees of combat maneuvers to t to touch on here. And once again, I'm going to say. I really hope that I really hope that there is a a um a combat tradition class chart. In the in the in the full book because I don't because I don't want to I don't want to have to, I don't want to have to jump back and forth to see to see if to see if um I to see if I can learn a maneuver from a from a particular tradition. Yeah. Um, and I think I think um, I think Tome of Battle had that when it came to which traditions were available to the th to the three classes that it added. So it can be done. Um, 
Then we have exploration next, which I, which we, um, which we'll probably say we'll probably save for when we get to the to the list of them. Um, mm -hmm. Same with war, same with warlord archetype. We can't do the, we can't do the subclass hour this time this time, so we'll have to so we'll have to instead spend some time dedicated solely to the archetypes. Yeah. But also at third level we get Mark Foe, where your martial direction improves the efficiency of your allies' attacks against an enemy you focus your attention on. You can use a bonus action to choose a creature you can see within thirty feet. And until the start of your next turn, creatures able able to hear you gain an expertise die on attacks made against that creature. So essentially, mar essentially, mar a the same a similar kind of marking that we've seen with rangers and and fourth edition strikers. It's it's a damaging mark. Mm -hmm. It's nothing special. I mark this in yellow. It's an effective pe ability. People are going to like it. I suspect. Mm -hmm. I don't know if something a little bit more complex or tactical would be useful or appropriate in the context of this document. We are advancing. We're leveling up 5e. We're not making a completely different game, so mm -hmm. I I get it. Um. It's, it's boring but effective. Yeah. Um, and uh, the the guy already has quite a few, mm. already has uh, quite a few cool abilities. Just what we have here. Yeah. ASI once again, I'm skipping because there's not a whole lot to say about it. Um. At fifth level, you we get combat directives, where you you learn one additional combat maneuver from the Sanguine Knot tradition. Which does not count against the number of maneuvers that you know, and when you use commanding, when a it says when a creature uses your commanding presence to use an attack. I'm not sure about the creature wording, but that's nitpicky. Um, but what? But it can simultaneously use one sanguine not combat maneuver that you know. If they don't have any exertion points to spend on combat maneuvers, it doesn't require exertion points, but it can't benefit from combat directives again unt until it's finished a short or long rest. Oh, Big complex. Go ahead. Yeah, it's es essentially your sh uh, I'd have to I'd have to I'd have to look further into I'd have to refresh my memory on um sanguine knot in terms of in terms of the features that it had. But over but overall I see this as just an expansion of the idea ideas from commanding presence. Um, I do think I'm not I'm not entirely sure on the on the way it treats exer exertion as a as as a one as a one and as a one and done like that. But it it doesn't. It's the idea is that okay, if you don't have if you're already tapped out and wouldn't otherwise be able to use this, you can you get one extra mm -hmm. effectively. That's the idea. I this is another kind of yellow for me because combat so when I was developing the champion something that was analogous to the champion fighter Thematically, at the very least, for Lords of Brachus, one of the abilities, or a set of abilities, was basically, you get to use what I use. I am an exemplar on the field of combat, and provided you're within my sphere of influence, with whatever that would mean in combat, you would, I would be able to choose certain things for you to use. Mm -hmm. Which is why I marked this in yellow, is because I don't think that... There's any particular reason to restrict this to Sanguine Knot. If you want people to use Sanguine Knot, that's fine, because they did say, hey, you get an extra maneuver, and specifically from Sanguine Knot, that's fine. The idea that you can only use one Sanguine Knot maneuver, and has to be one that you know for commanding pro presence, is a compounded restriction that I'm not a fan of. I think it should just be a maneuver of which... You're aware. I looked back at the sanguine knot maneuvers, and I think the reason they went with that is all of all of these sanguine knot maneuvers, the ones that we saw in Fighter, were 
were all based on um, all based on cooperative actions with allies. Right. At Which is, you know, it's it makes we see why they did that. Mm -hmm. I would prefer it if I would prefer it if one of those restrictions were lifted, though. And you're getting a. I mean, here's the thing: if sanguine not is already so beneficial and stuff like that, you can. You, it's a combat directive. You could say, "All right, you choose the combat. You know, the sanguine not tradition that they use." Or the tradition that you use, the tra you declare basically what maneuver they're going to use. The creature benefiting from this doesn't get to use this because it's your combat directive. Mm -hmm. Right? And given that Sanguine Knot tends to be more cooperative and you got an additional combat maneuver from that tradition for free, that would be all the incentive you really needed for this person to use sanguine not in a number of useful situations and if it wasn't all the incentive that you needed then the players have decided or discovered within the context of the game that they prefer between their characters some other combat tradition to use maneuvers in combat directives mm -hmm. that's fine they should be allowed to do that they have discovered there like there's no negative number interaction as far as I can tell, because you're giving up attacks for this to work properly. Mm -hmm. so there's no negative interaction there. It's just a it's just a tactical consideration for it's it's one of these things where like okay, they specifically want you to use something because they think it fits thematically. The players are already going to do that. We we went through this last time with the barbarian. It's like oh, you can only use these. I think brutal critical. You can only use this. On weapons which are heavy or versatile, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and there was a specific list of weapons that you would be able to use on it. And the obvious reason being that, like, oh, well, this is thematically appropriate for a barbarian. Well, if it's thematically appropriate for a barbarian, and it's numerically appropriate for a barbarian, and ninety percent of people are probably going to use this anyways, uh, you don't need to put the restriction in. Unless it's avoiding some sort of negative number interaction, which it's clearly not. If somebody's going to use something that's less damaging than a uh, uh, than a great axe, that's not really necessary. You're just artificially cutting out the last ten percent of weird builds that people are going to come up with and weird character concepts, and telling them they can't do that pointlessly because you want to fulfill a specific narrative manifestation that was already on its way this is silly don't do this i do and um for maybe it's just me but part of the part of the fun when it comes to character building is coming up with weird builds um i that's that's why that's why i have that's why i have fond memories of things like the muscle wizard it's a it's a build that on in that most people wouldn't try and do, but the, but if somebody if somebody wants to have the opportunity to do it, there it is. Um, but move moving right along. Um, next is extra attack, which once again skipping. I would I will say that I that um that this has a more interesting use uh you more interesting um opportunity with that with the extra attacks gained at fifth and eleventh simply because. Of the fact that you're actually having some degree of an action economy, um, you also get followers at fifth level and every five levels after that, and they put in an interesting aside that I'm cur I'm curious on you on your guys's take. It says followers in level up are not full NPCs. Instead, a follower of a specific type, including cook, bodyguard, porter, squire, and others, grant you an ability that you can use once between each long rest. At other times, followers simply fade into the background. While you are welcome to imbue followers with personalities and quirks, you are not required to. If followers are inappropriate to your campaign, a warlord can gain these abilities themselves instead. Mark this up, Brad. Go ahead, Zan. I was going to say that that last little passage there is a a good way to basically just invalidate followers. Like, if followers don't fit in the campaign, just give the abilities to the warlord. Well, then what's the point of followers in the first place? 
is one of those wishy-washy areas where they don't want to they yeah, they don't want to come interact in. with somebody's campaign world. It's like, no, fuck your campaign world. I don't care. Yeah, we're in the Alps. Guess what? We we found uh we came across a party of people who survived cannibalism or whatever have you, or there was, I was some about, I was about to make a Donner party joke. Yeah, I I see I also was going to make a Donner party. That sort of was a Donner party reference. I just didn't do it. It's, clearly it worked, because you got it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> clearly it worked. Uh or machines come out of the earth and serve as you know your cook or whatever i don't i don't particularly care Old. what you have to do in order to make this fit but this is the game and you mr gm or mrs or anything else are there to provide as little friction as possible and supervise the interactions between my game as the designer and my players don't put don't put this wishy-washy shit in so when it when it comes to the red, are you putting it for that bo- for that box or for the idea of followers? Period. Uh, definitely for the for the box. Not necessarily. There is something to be said for we we should dive into this. We well, should definitely dive into this because this is. I know where it's. We go I back. know it's that. Yeah. Go ahead. go ahead. I was just gonna say I know it's that last uh that last bit that last part on the box where. You basically just invalidate the rest of the box. That's the that's what got it the red. I know that. I sort of, sort of. So otherwise, this might be yellow. Otherwise, because I like the idea that certain classes are going to get followers by virtue of their adventuring. Right. That's that's just a thing that happens. Mm-hmm. At tenth level, you get an apprentice if you happen to be a wizard. At you get a sycophant if you are a sorcerer of sixth level like this these concepts are cool to me this is what should yeah this is this is appropriate for this sort of game especially in the tradition that i mentioned earlier where playing the rpg playing through the rpg is the zoomed in scale between much wider events which are happening and you have sort some sort of ability to impact or effect or cause Frankly, like again, mass combat followers are fantastic for that, and they followers can provide extraordinarily important social functions, and that's fantastic. I want them to be followers, I want them to be present in the game. I do not want, I would like <sighs> this is this is difficult because you may have decided, they may have decided that are right, including a bunch of NPCs with hit points and whatever have you, it is going to make certain combats and it's going to make certain other things difficult. And just having certain just having a certain number of NPCs fade into the background whenever combat breaks out and abstracting their contribution to an ability is a perfectly acceptable solution to that. It's not my ideal solution. Fifth edition is not my ideal game. It's certainly not my ideal base with which to build an advanced version upon, as I've had to do with Chilmas Valley, sort of in the other direction. I totally get it. I totally get it. But, all the same, when it comes to followers, it's, I would like to see notes about, hey, this is how other characters can have followers. This is what happens if a warlord gets more followers on their own, just through their activities through play. Simply so we can put in the the disclaimer, basically an effective disclaimer for people who think that having a character ability forbids anybody else from using that ability or doing anything adjacent or similar to that ability in any context whatsoever within the game. Because, and this is one of those things where I largely like the OSR. I'm a big fan of the OSR. Uh, This is a lie that they have been telling people for 40 years. And it's permeated the culture of RPGs and must be counteracted. We've said, all right, warlords get followers at specific levels. We should probably put in a little... We we need to have in a uh, side block about, listen, this is how you're going to get these NPC followers in other means... But the warlord just gets them for free because they're warlords, and that fits with the character. 
It's a little bit of extra for them. Had they done that, this would be yellow or even blue. Because I do like the idea that certain classes just happen to get followers. Uh, particularly of specific types. And one of the benefits for a warlord might be, oh, well, you're, you're a warlord. You get a follower of any given type. And that's, that's an expression of how the warlord is special in this specific instance, because they're a warlord. The potential armies they command are vast, numerous, diverse, and mm -hmm. could come from anywhere. And hence, they can get followers from just about anywhere of, of any type. Fine. But they didn't do that. Uh, they. This is too abstract. I it's am... too wishy-washy, and it does not have the... It does not say anything of an underlying structure, which needs, at the very least, reference to. Please. I my I myself am am essentially res, essentially reserving ju reserving judgment until 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 the until I see the um fo the followers themselves and see the abil and see the abilities that are that that um they that they can grant. So consider that tentative for me. Um. So next is next at sixth level is call to arms. Where at sixth level, when you roll initiative, um, you and everyone that's fr that's friendly to you within ra within range of commanding presence gain an expertise die um, to their initiative. Additionally, when you roll for initiative, you can switch your result with that of any ally you can see. Um, when it comes to this, the the for the former one is eh. The because you're because you're probably going to be in relatively close formation once bit once battle starts most of the time. Um, the latter one I find more interesting. You know, being it's certainly thematically appropriate mm -hmm. and exciting. It's like all right, well I can I can switch with one person. It's it's not allowing you to rearrange the entirety of the initiative progress, but just switching with one person could make a lot of activity so much easier and it's it's clearly one thing that these designers have done a good job on without any particular reservations is establishing what the warlord's role is mm -hmm. they're the person here who is going to provide moment-to-moment -moment tactical decisions for everybody and make them available to them Now, the other thing it's the other thing at sixth level that's gra that's granted is martial renown, which is essentially our our um our nar our narrative choice feature that we've seen a lot in the cl in the class entries. Um. So you get you add your proficiency bonus to your to your to your renown score, um, which I think is I think is some the renown score I think is something that. Wasn't that hit? Wasn't that hinted at? In I remember that there was something that that there was something like that that was hinted at. Explained in, the, in this document somewhere, if I yeah. recall correctly. Yeah, I think it was explained in a previous document, and I think I think there was something in in a pre in a pre either a previous entry or in one of, or in one of the core books that went to, that went a little bit further with it. In any case, it's a it's a D twenty versus basically a, a DC provided by the realm. Mm -hmm. And if you're outside of a given realm in which you would have renown, you have disadvantage on the roll. Yeah. Yeah, I, rem I remember sharing I remember sharing a bit of that with a bit of that with you. And when it comes to the three appro the three approaches, we have famous, yeah. infamous and ma and maverick. Yeah. Um the expertise die. It once again. That's ki that's kind of eh, that's kind of eh. Um, but it's, it's coming with a. Th this gets blue. Mm -hmm. This gets blue because it's coming with an ability which is a specific impact on the game. Yeah. 
which is what you I arrive think. in a settlement after you reveal who you are, which is an interesting distinction. Mm -hmm. Local authority figures seek you out to make introductions and invite you to share a meal or drink. You get the VIP treatment whenever you come into an area that's appropriate. Yeah. Um, let's see. In infamous um, has it that has it that people hurry to get out of your way, and when you corner someone to ask something local, they'll tell you whatever details they think you might want to know. Um, which is which I'd say is a prime opportunity for a G, for a GM to give the player bullshit. Um, of course, all these are. Mm -hmm. Let's see, um, Maverick. I, Maverick, to me, I I would find the most interesting, depend depending on the campaign that it's used. Simply because the idea the idea of the idea of the thieves guild or assassins guild or any di or any disreputable stand um, appro approaching you when you when you come into town has a whole lot of potential. Yeah, I mean the the idea, you know, Anna Mandras Drake comes to Dejuristan and is approached by the is approached by the High Council and some famous alchemists. It's fairly, yeah, it's fairly appropriate. They, seeing Maverick makes me a little bit annoyed because really, it go, it goes back to the discussion we had earlier about Sanguine not and well, you're only allowed to use this specific combat tradition for. Mm -hmm. Uh, allowing people to modify their attacks according to commanding presence. And I said it's overly restrictive because if you want people to use, you, there's already enough, clearly enough mechanical incentive there for people to use this thing most of the time. And when they're not using it, there's usually a very good reason for it, which could be thematic, it could be mechanical. It's your job to figure out why they're doing that and whether or not it's too far out of line, too far out of bounds mm -hmm. in the context of your RPG. But certainly for the playtest, I don't think that's appropriate. When they develop these abilities, they clearly said, oh, well, some of you, obviously not every warlord is the same. They're all not knights in shining armor, commanding armies and stuff like that. Some of them might have a more sinister, subtle bent. Who knows? You know, somebody might be somebody might be a little bit more of a sneaky warlord where their their martial prowess is put to use in the hands of assassins and thieves. In which case, the same logic could be applied to something like, hmm, perhaps one of my allies using one of my using my commanding presence would benefit instead from Sanguine Knot would instead benefit from Zephyr Strike, where they're able to do a sleight of hand check upon smacking somebody is one of the maneuvers available from that tradition, and that's why it makes me upset. Yeah, But otherwise, these are all cool. They, they, they Obviously, they're not listening, but they've clearly taken our advice mm -hmm. uh, regarding, alright, please don't just do the expertise die. Please provide a specific... Please evoke a specific situation or narrative impact or scene as a consequence of this ability. Do not just make a number for a check higher thank you. Mm -hmm. And thank you, because they did. Yeah. Now next now next is versatile versatile exploration. So whenever you learn a new explore you whenever you learn a new exploration knack or replace an existing one, you can choose from fight from fighter ones. I'd say that I'd say that's appropriate. Um, then we have spur. Mark out. that one in yellow. Yeah. Because uh, I like I like the idea that you could choose from fighter. Mm -hmm. That's kind of cool. Um, I want other class. I want other classes added to that list. I haven't seen. We haven't done the paladin. We haven't seen the paladin as far as I know. So I don't know if that would fit or not. What I can tell you should probably fit is the ranger. Yeah, I. Is the ranger is spellless and useless right now because they listen to people who didn't know what they were talking about in regards to whether or not what would make the ranger more unique. 
And so, sadly, the ranger was gimped a little bit, but in that gimping, which was unnecessary, they did provide themselves with the perfect excuse or reason to include that in this particular list. Well, the warlord would have access to this, to these uh, different exploration acts. Mm -hmm. Now, at ninth level, we have Spur Ally, where... Whenever an ally you see fails a ability check or saving throw, you can use your reaction to make them re-roll. Um, but you you have to finish a long rest before you could use it again. Boo. Um, and although it can be a, a short or long rest at thirteenth level, I like the idea. But once again, once again, the whole the whole rest economy thing leaves it will continue to leave a sour taste in my mouth. Maybe one's for long rest per person. Maybe it's uh, give me give me some means of. Maybe it's less effective as it goes on. Maybe it's not just a reroll. Maybe it's an expertise like, like there's. It's an opportunity. I understand. This is the sort of nitpicking where I can. I am empathizing with the designers while I do it because, like, listen, I I get that you don't want to pop in something that's too complex because it's in the middle of a monster's turn. And you don't want to pop off some weird tactical ability that has some weird interaction with some other rule. I get it. I get it. Uh, it's just a reroll. It's just once per long rest. There's there's other ways to do this, probably. I know that they're, you'd have to dig for them more than everything else. It's a playtest. That's fine. But maybe dig. Now that you've made this, maybe you've identified you've identified the... Narrative reason for having this mechanic. Cool. Maybe now that you've done that, do a little bit more digging. Mm -hmm. um, at 10th level is Expanded Directives. Where you, you choose one tradition that you know combat maneuvers from. You're able to use combat directives to, gain you, to grant uses of combat maneuvers from the chosen tradition. At 15th level, choose a second tradition you know combat maneuvers from. Um, so it, and yeah, that one's so that one goes into something that, huh? I'm not sure if I this comes so late in the game. I'm not sure if I like it, but I do like the fact that they recognized. I have to. I do have to walk back some of the stuff that I said earlier because clearly they recognize. Okay, yes, not everybody is of this specific type, and their restriction to using sanguine not in the use of. Uh, combat directives is more of a is more of a milestone in your progress to eventually be able to use this ability mm -hmm. which is sort of the full version of it that's okay all right um also at 10th is rouse the troops where you spend one minute speaking words of encouragement and support to reinvigorate companions. Each friendly creature that can see or hear you can spend any number of hit dice to regain hit points without having to finish a short rest. In addition, each creature that does spend at least one hit die in this way can remove one level of fatigue or resolve, or resolve that it is suffering from. Um, once a creature has removed a level of fatigue or resolve from your use of this class feature, they must finish a long rest before doing so again. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe I've got bad eyes, but it looks like fatigue or resolve is in a different color, and I keep thinking it's supposed to be a hyperlink to something. I, don't I know think there. I think th it is in a different color. If I could, if I'm understanding this, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted. To, I just wanted to make sure I, my eyes weren't playing tricks on me or something, but. It's in my highlight thing here. Uh, yeah, I, I initially highlighted this in yellow. I think it should probably be blue now that I've looked at it again. Is is the restriction for getting rid of fatigue or resolve is is fine mm -hmm. because it's something that you need to rest in order to effectively get rid of. That's that's the definition of those 
negative penalties, so that's fully appropriate. This is... Especially since what, the, what this is essentially granting is a cheat. <laughs> your, your, your sides... Your, your, um, at, the, at the cost of only being able to do it once per long rest, you're sidestepping a mechanic. Well, no, you're you're doubling the effectiveness of something you otherwise would only be able to do at a slower rate. Mm -hmm. You're you're accelerating the rate at which you're able to recover from things like fatigue or resolve. Doubling it specifically, assuming you use this ability daily. Yeah. Um. Let's see, then at twelfth level we get commanding demeanor, where the less where which is following up on the whole choose choose one of the three and we have calm resolute and responsive um let's see calm let's see calm as long as as long as your mates give your no letting your silence speak long speak louder than words as long as the npc has a cr lower than your level and remains within sight of you for the duration, it acts as if you succeeded on an intimidation check. Resolute, whenever you make a an, a mental ch check against a creature and fail, you gain an expertise die on your next one. So do you want to do you want to go over these? Um, I'm look. I'd say I'd say when it comes to the, when it comes to the three of them, I the I the. The idea of calm is is sound, but um, I I will I always have a I always have a mixed opinion on um, on challenge rating. I have for years. Um, Resolute is a glorified do a glorified um, do over. Not an not an immediate do over, but but it certainly has that kind of leaning. Yeah, that's the, that's the only benefit it provides you is you get to. Um, and resp responsive. I'd I'd say res I'd say res I'd say calm and responsive have the most narrative potential. And res responsive uh, responsive is it is a little bit more social butterfly esque. Right, let's let's look at this. Whether between duelists or armies, I'm actually not going to read that. Uh, when you overhear an interesting conversation between NPCs, you can interject so seamlessly and casually that the speakers think they already know you, answering one question you ask before realizing they don't. This is this is a bit of social butterfly, and boy, is that like the, this is the diplomacy element of this l grander scale. Uh, put the, this grander scale. Mm -hmm. I said that as if I had another word to follow follow scale, and I didn't. There's another element of that grander scale, a variety of play that I was mentioning earlier. We're like, okay, you go to the enemy embassy, or you go to you go to some place where you need to figure out information, and you need access to leverage of some variety for whatever purpose that you have in mind. And you go over and you. See some diplomats, diplomats chatting it up. You go in, you say something, and uh, they respond to you, and then they realize, "Oh, you're you're that guy." Whoops. Whoops. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. It's very dramatic, and I love that. Some people might have an issue with the idea, like, "Like, oh, well, you should say that." It's like, eh, no, my, I, I shouldn't have to. The player at the table having an ability which allows me to just do that and the GM can decide whatever that question or comment was that I said to provoke that reaction in this very unique circumstance is is fine mm -hmm. as a character ability. There's no there's no problem with that. Yeah. Now at thirteenth level we get Dauntless, where allies within your commanding presence have advantage on saving throws against spells and effects that cause charmed or frightened um it's not a bad idea uh -huh. on, not a bad idea on paper i'm just not sure if it's if it's 13th level worthy mm. 
I well, it's think about it. You're getting two abilities of thirteenth level, mm -hmm. one of which is, as far as I can tell, far more impactful. Yeah, let's get let's get to that strongholds. Um, you gain an average grade four stronghold, a keep or a or a mansion, and once again they have a sidebar regard in this case regarding strongholds, saying strongholds. Str Strong bolds. <laughs> Strongholds in level up are mainly treated in the abstract. You do not need to manage the stronghold yourself or even, vi or even visit it unless you want to, but it grants you extra renown, followers, and special abilities. A stronghold is akin t to a feat in function. The method by which you come by the stronghold is up to your GM. Some examples include, inher include inheritance or a gift or of land as a reward. If a stronghold is inappropriate for your campaign, you can gain the same abilities without the physical stronghold itself. I think this falls into the same category as the sidebar, as your sidebar grading for um, followers. Not quite, not quite. Most of this is marked in blue. Uh, there is one, the the actual ability itself is marked in yellow because I think you actually get it too late. I'd like to see this at ninth level. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see this at ninth level. Uh, insofar as the strongholds are considered, the sidebar is concerned, it's mostly cool. It's like, all right, extra renowned followers and special abilities. This is how the stronghold should work. I like the fact that they give you it for free. And unlike the note about followers, I think this will, like, like if they're including strongholds in the game, there's going to be an underlying structure for strongholds. I'm mm -hmm. confident in that. So I don't have the same concern that I did with followers to where, like, all right, well, does everybody else, is everybody, are all the followers NPCs, are some of them NPCs, is there an underlying structure? Do they only use this solution when it comes to this particular class? I don't know that stuff, and I would prefer, if this is going to be the first mention of them, I would like some preview of that underlying structure at the very least, which they provide in Strongholds, because they tell you, hey... Extra renowned followers and special abilities. It's akin to a feat in function. Fine, that's that's all right. I hope that I hope that there's more to them than that. But we'll get to that whenever they talk about strongholds next. Yeah. Um, uh, there is one note that needs to be the stronghold is inappropriate for your campaign. You can no, there is no campaign in which strongholds are inappropriate. Mm -hmm. um, Declare if... that. Declare that you will get the stronghold. Figure it out. The GM knows in advance that you're playing this class. They can figure it out. That's their job. If the you stronghold is appropriate for every campaign. If you absolutely have have to put your foot down as far as it as far as it being inappropriate, I do I do hope that there will be a sidebar explaining some possibilities on how you can justify these adva these advantages without without falling into that. That's and th and keep in mind that's a big ass if and they, and even I wouldn't go wouldn't go down that route. More of a okay. Here's a here's an idea and how here's an example of how you could do it if you want to go that route. Well, that's that's the easy solution is you level you leveled up. That's that's why you get these new abilities, which is the same reason you get any other new abilities. You leveled up. Mm -hmm. You're and so now you have access to whatever this is through whatever resource. You got it through, but it you leveled up. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's insofar as the stronghold, don't don't say, well, it's inappropriate for it. No, 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 no. It's appropriate for every campaign. Mm -hmm. It's. I think it's safe to say it's. I. It's real. I consider this integral to the warlord. Put it in the campaign. A lot of these, the stronghold makes a lot of these other features more meaningful because of the context it adds to the campaign. All, all of our references earlier to the concepts of diplomacy and renown and these different social abilities you have access to, the stronghold matters in that context. Mm -hmm. It produces that context. Tell people the stronghold matters. Do the stronghold. Yeah. Now, yeah. Next, next at 14th level is advantageous action where you can use the help action as a bonus action, and when you take that action, the target can benefit from one, from one of the following effects that you choose. Either A, end the frightened com condition, B, um, grant one creature within five feet of you temporary hit points equal to your charisma, or C, um, 
that creature gains one, that creature regains one hit point. Um, the frightened condition one, I don't see that getting all that much use. The other two, I see getting far more use. I like the fact that you could, <laughs> the fact that you're able to go over to one person and say, "All right, well," because you, you could help. All right, you could take the help action, right? Mm -hmm. You go over to one person. It doesn't actually have to be the person that you're helping that gets these temporary hit points, for instance. So you could give the help action to one person, and somebody next to them gets temporary hit points. I like the I like the mental image of that occurring. I think it's quite cool. Mm -hmm. And I also like the fact that this competes for action economy with, at this point, other Warlord features and a plethora of various maneuvers that you would otherwise have access to. It seems as though the Warlord is has the greatest access to not only altering his own action economy, but also act altering the action economy of other character classes, which, of course, also helps distinguish him from the Bard. Mm -hmm. oh. This is uh, this is pretty cool. Yeah. And at 16th level, your stronghold is upgraded to grade 5, castle or or um, cathedral. Um, not a whole lot to say about not a whole lot to say about that as it is. Um, I'd have to I'd I'd have to save that for if there so for if there's a um time where we get to delve more into strongholds in and of themselves. But um, do you think do you think great? So because of the, the big problem is that I is that I don't know the full grading setup that they have for strongholds. So there's not really a whole lot I can say at this moment. About whether I would or... like a distinction because I assume I can get more than one. Uh, I assume I can get. How do I put this? I assume we could get more than one stronghold, right? I think that's. I think that's reasonable. Hopefully, I think it's hopefully reasonable. Uh, and if so, I would like maybe. Might be prudent to just specify, like, hey, this upgrades the stronghold that you get from your level 13 ability. Yeah. Um. And it would be neat, something I was thinking of when I looked at this ability is, is perhaps that grade 5 is something that, you know, this would otherwise be, unless you were getting, given that you're giving this, getting this for free, it's fantastic, because otherwise you would have to spend an inordinate amount of money or other resources in order to accomplish something like grade five mm -hmm. uh, time <laughs> being one of those potential resources. And this just kind of gives it to you. And I, I suspect that is the case. Yeah. I suspect that is the case. I think that's why they put this stuff in here. So that's, mm -hmm. I, I'm going to give it a, it needs some additional clarifications and some additional insights into the strongholds would be useful this is why I mentioned earlier that, like, hey, if you're going to introduce a new mechanic, probably, probably tell us a little bit about that mechanic in the document. But the time is a limited resource. I get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a cool ability, and I think it certainly it's going to be. If the other work from these designers is any indication, it's going to be executed properly. I think. Yeah. Um, at seventeenth level is critical weakness. Where, as a bonus action, you can choose a creature you can see within 60 feet. Um, until the end of your next turn, any creature able to hear you has advantage on attack rolls made against that creature. And their attacks and spells do an extra 6 damage. When you've used this, you can't use it again until you finish a short or long rest. Um, I, I don't have a problem with the ability in and of itself. What I have a problem with is the placement at 17th level. And on, and only having a boost of six damage. For the, I feel like I feel like with some with something like this, you either need to up the amount of damage so that you justify the restrictions, or ease up on the restrictions. Yeah, I don't. It's the level seventeen ability. Is I I start zoning out when I look at some of these because I think 
everything else is so jam packed. I can see them being like, ah, we're running out of. I have the sense they they were running out a little bit on Steam insofar as motivation and ideas were being con were concerned. But it's a level seventeen ability, and it's right after you get this other ability. So it's like, yeah, we're making more minor increments as time goes on. Mm -hmm. Um. At and honestly, it's a good ability. It's a good ability. People have advantage on attack rolls made against them, and you get extra six damage to them on attacks and spells, which is I I think that I honestly think that's good. Mm -hmm. Although um, you already ha although you already have you already had an ability er early on when it came to yeah you you already had a ability for mar for get for granting oh, sorry in that case it was. Um, expertise die. So you're getting advantage and an expertise die because you'd stack, because unless they say otherwise, I think you can stack that with Mark Foe. The only thing that would prevent you from stacking that would be action economy or any kind of uh, resource that you would have to expend for it. Which is why you might use one on one given enemy and hold off on another enemy. So you have it's one of these instances where you have a plethora of abilities which operate which operate in similar mechanical domains and have identical either similar or identical resource timers which is actually kind of cool at this point because now okay I have what are basically three very very for example three variations of one general thematic ability hmm. expressed in a specific mechanic and all of them are once per short or long rest, or all of them are once per long rest, in in this hypothetical. Mm -hmm. And so now I get to choose which one of those I'm going to use for, you know. All of these are basically, hey guys, gank that guy. Kill him. Mm -hmm. Everybody kill that guy. Yep. And you're getting slightly different variations of everybody kill that guy, which... You're not going to be able to use the same ability twice in a row, but you get to do something similar an increasingly an increasing number of times per day by virtue of just getting a different iteration of it. I think I think that is cool. Now at 18th level, we have another um, we have another narrative we have another um, narrat narrative trinity as I'm as I'm calling it until I can come up with a better term for these for these kind of class featured choices. Um, in this case, we have the choices between hero, iconoclast, and slaughterer. Um, hero is just a upgraded version of the previous VIP treatment. Um, and and you'll essentially get eight. You'll essentially be starting out with at least eighteen days of the of said VIP treatment. Um. <laughs> Um, icon iconoclast. Let's see, you are visited by one d four plus one bards, scholars, and sages, asking for recountings of your recent exploits, and they share a piece of information they think might be relevant to your quest, or make a a mental check at a bonus of plus five on your behalf to answer a specific question. I can see that getting some potential and um slaw slaughterer. Let's see. Um, whenever you, whenever you end with certain enemies, they will try, they will try and they will, they will, their first action will be declaring that they know of your process, prowess and offering an alliance. Um, <laughs> let's, I, let's, let's go into that. Let's go into that. Yeah. Is, is tale, I'm going to read out the full thing. Mm -hmm. Tales of your merciless bloodshed have won you friends in unlikely places. Bandit and pirate captains, crime lords, intelligent monsters of ill intent, and even fiends know who you are and that you're a valuable ally, doing their best to persuade you to take up the sword against their enemies. Whenever you encounter such a creature, it spends its first action, even in combat, declaring that it knows of your prowess and offering an alliance. That's good. <laughs> I know, That's really good. I know with one. I know with one of the previous Trinity choices, we mentioned that there were that there were one or two that were going to get more use than others. I can't really say that with, in this case. All three of these have it have an I'd say a relatively equal amount of potential, just in different yeah. ways. I 
I think I'm going to take it a step further because I made that evaluation about the previous ones. I think that they all have the potential. It's just a matter of whether or not you find them individually appealing. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, I think all three of them are individually appealing to just about anybody. Yeah. Because the concepts are so simultaneously broad, but offering fantastic benefits. Mm -hmm. um, any one of the... You might want to be any one of these. Let's see. And, at, and we have two capstones. The first is Supreme Stronghold. So your stronghold is upgraded to grade 6, um, Fortress or Palace. Um, once again, once again, when it comes to the grade numbers, what I, what I immediately want to see what, what, if we are able to cover strongholds in the future, no, no matter how, no matter how it ends up taking is an example of all the grades and how, and how reasonably big each would be as an example. Like when it comes to, when it comes to, for, when it comes to the, when it comes to fortress, are we ta are we talking um, are 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 we ta are we talking the are we talking the the big the big citadels that do, that do that do that can do siege warfare for days or we t or something else? Um, plus, I keep think I keep thinking of how if if this was say thirteenth age, there would be an example of each um. Of each type of holding ba themed around each of the um, icons, which would actually make a decent bit of writing material given how the thirteen icons work, and it'd be an interesting challenge to do the to do the um, holding for say the Lord of Shadows or even for the three. Oh, um, but the other the other one is. Is another another um, Trinity choice, but this one it this one is interesting. Let's see, at first off, friendly creatures within range within range of your commanding presence add your charisma modifier to their saving throws. And sent and since that's added to all their saving throws, that's it. That's that's going to be useful. If you if you if you've been paying attention to charisma, which I think with this kind of class, you probably should. Um, and you ch you can choose one of the three: commander's expertise, feedback loop, and rapid deployment. Um, let's see, commander's expertise. Whenever a creature uses your commanding presence to make an attack, it gains an expertise die. If the combat maneuver has a save DC, it increases by an amount equal to the expertise die, to a maximum of a D12. Um, feedback loop. When a creature uses your commanding presence and successfully hits, you gain a reaction. You must use this reaction before the start of your next turn, or it is lost. And rapid deployment. After initiative is rolled, then and com and until combat ends, your speed increases by 20, and allies that are able to see or hear you increase their speed by 20. Rapid deployment, I like the most out of these three. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Giving giving almost the whole party a an an extra four squares worth of movement. Effective. Mm -hmm. I'd say, I'd say the I'd say of these three, the two the two that I like the most is um, rapid deployments at the top. Commander's expertise is a close second. And that's not to say feedback loop is is useless. I just I just think that the I just think that the other two are slightly better. Mm. I'm split. I'm split. I don't know if that's a good thing or not, but I'm I'm split. But Also, also, although with although if that's the example of the cap of the caps of the fact that you have a choice of capstones, essentially with with this setup, I'm all the more interested in see, in seeing how how some of the other classes ta tackled 
would utilize would utilize a similar setup with capstones because what we're kind of seeing here is a bit is a bit of the framework for how the how the um, teens levels would wor may may work with the other classes, and we can we kind of have that narrative arc because there's there's been there's been the there's been the joke for a while that at higher levels five e characters become superheroes. I feel like in I feel like in some ways some of the narrative features with the warlord at higher levels is kind of embracing that. Especially since one of them is literally hero. I certainly feel as if this class would be a good or maybe not necessarily maybe not necessarily good a potential express if I wanted to play Corwin of Amber. Or if I wanted to play Benedict, uh, this would be a potentially this is this is fodder for that. Mm -hmm. This could be a mechanical expression of that character. I g I gotcha. Um. Let's now let's see. Then when it comes to the exploration next, we've got. We've got a f we've got a few of them to deal with. We have five in total: um, exacting, lay of the land, rewarding repute, soldier kidding, and team tactics. Um, some of th and when it come did when it came to when it came to these, were there any specifically that you highlighted? None that I. Hmm. Wait. No, I do have highlights here. Give me a moment. I have one. Okay, Lay of the Land. I put that in yellow because we have, let's see here, Knowledge of the Terrain can be the difference between victory and defeat. By spending 10 minutes observing the area in a two-mile radius, you can spend two exertion points to pick out where there are choke points, large swaths of cover, blah, blah, blah. Uh, basically figure out whether or not it's effective for an ambush. Mm -hmm. You gain an expertise die on engineering and survival checks made within the area and on checks to prepare an ambush or realize that you're being ambushed. Um, exp that expertise die, man. This is one of those instances because you're spending two exertion points on doing this. Do not give me the higher die. Allow me to do so. Give me the ability like a counterattack or give me an a an ability to to evade the ambush, right? So that initially, you know, everybody pounces on this. They see us, and everybody pounces on this one area, and the dust is kicked up, and there's a cloud, and visibility is poor, and there's confusion and yelling and fighting and the swinging of swords, and the dust settles, and the enemy looks around themselves because in that middle, in the middle of that large, very large uh, circle of blades doesn't happen to be the people they were ambushing and if we're gonna spend normally normally with the with the res like i'm spending resources on this it's not it's atypical for a lot of the exploration acts that we've looked at i feel like i already hate the idea of giving me a giving me some sort of survive uh, the bonus based on a expertise die i, I this I... is I struggle. Yeah. I struggle to. I struggle to understand the reasoning for for needing to for needing to use exertion points as a as a cost for this when you already have a time cost as it is, a substantial one at that. Yeah, because that and um, throughout throughout most of the time that we've seen exertion points. It's always been it's always been tied to maneuver use, and honestly, I think that's where it should stay. The idea of the idea of utilizing it, un unless you want to go with a full on stamina system, which the exertion points aren't in the in the same way fatigue in the same way you have fatigue systems in other games. I would ra I would rather it I would rather exertion points be used specifically for maneuvers and and not much else. You know, keep it in, keep it in that particular bubble. Is 
Can you say that again? It sounds like you're getting progressively further and further away from the microphone. Um, am I coming through now? I was slightly better. All right. I was saying is I don't I don't really see the point of the whole spend two exertion points for this when you are when you already have the uh, when you already have the time cost. It's okay to double dip on resource costs and stuff like that, provided that the ability, provided the benefit, is worth that cost. This is this is similar to my issue with the Ranger's Primeval Awareness, is that you'd be able to, in Beast 5th Edition, is you would be able to spend a spell slot and figure out if, you know, if you're if a type of enemy was within a mile radius of you, or five miles if it was your favorite enemy. Congrats, you figured out that they're somewhere within that radius. No further information, no further benefit, and now you're down a spell slot. I if I go into the if I go into the place that's going that I'm gonna get ambushed in, I think I'd much rather have those two exertion points. Because I'm going to realize that I'm going to be ambushed. I will realize that I'm going to that I'm going to get ambushed. That's fine. When I am, and I'm going to realize it when I actually get ambushed. And there's mm -hmm. plenty of stuff I have access to in my kit, many of which actually does rely on those pesky exertion points to make sure that I actually live through the encounter. Uh, the one exception being, of course, that you could prepare an ambush of your own, and that expertise die might actually really come in handy, depending on what subjects are. But that's going to be... It's its not going to be a unique circumstance, but it is going to be on the rarer side of things. And by and large, not worth the effort or cost. Mm -hmm. Very uh, frustrating. Yeah. Um... Rewarding, re rewarding reputes. I've got, I've got no issue with, and and when it comes to, when it comes to the um the expertise die, I'm I'm ignoring that because I don't want to repeat myself. Um. Sol soldier kit, soldier kitting is um. I can see that being useful depending on how depending on how stringent the GM is on encumbrance. Some GMs are less so. Some GMs are more so. Um. It's it's going to be one of those varying things, um, and t and as f and as far as as far as team as far as team tactics, I'm kind of iffy on that. Oh, sim simply because I have a particular com comment on it. Yeah. Now we. D like I mentioned before, we have three, we have three warlord archetypes. Um, those being the gambling general, peasant lieutenant, and tactical commander. Um, the gambling general, I say, is a successor to the Bravo warlord from for, from fourth edition. Um, but one thing that I'm finding interesting with how they're doing archetypes is. It's not a case of once you're at this level you get one, you get this one ability. No, you have choices. It looks like you've got to, it looks like you've got two ch In fact, yeah, each each tier each tier with it you have two potential choices and that's not something you I think you see that with some subclasses in base 5e, but not all that often. Rare it's it's on the rare end. Mhm. Mm And Very I, much on the red. This actually gives me hope for the ranger. Hmm. This maybe will turn out to be dog shit. <laughs> or less dog shit. Spell is, spell is, God, spell is ranger was not the thing that they should have gone with there. Jesus. They're spending too much time online. Yeah. Oh. Now, I, I do have, I do have to slightly correct myself because the, pe the peasant, the peasant lieutenant does have does have some that are just one, that are just one ability um one ability advantages but not all but that's but the I'd say the majority are not are not that case um 
Because the because the only one the only ones that they have that are on that on that particular tier is skirmisher, which is moot because you're which you already get you're already gonna be get making a choice because of make haste, um, nimble tr nimble troops, um, and that and that's the, that's the only that's the only ones on their part, um. Tactical commander has has a bit more has a bit more has a bit more sync has a bit more um single cho single choice features, but I can't help but notice that there is a lot more options with them. Um, between the, between the three between the three of them were there in, were between the three um archetypes was there anything that stood out to you for highlights? I think that they are all pretty effective at what they do. I did note the daring commander and the first three abilities that you get access to. It's while you're conscious, any ally daring assault. While you're conscious, any ally within range of your commanding presence that makes an attack roll can choose to roll with a minus five penalty. If the attack hits, the attack deals an extra two d six damage. Fifteenth level, the amount of extra damage increases to three d six. This is again. I don't think we need to go over more abilities in these in these subclasses, mm -hmm. other than to, because this is going to be the this is emblematic of my earlier thesis statement when I said, "Listen, they are doing a the designers are have if they have one proficiency whatsoever, it is establishing a narrative context and fulfilling that narrative ideal, fulfilling that narrative fantasy." with the mechanics provided and doing a really good job of differentiating both narrative and mechanical roles from the different classes. This is why I think that this class can exist in the same system as the Bard, because the Bard is going to be doing a lot more, going to have access to a lot more offensive stuff. They have access to a lot more things which are not, they're not really based on choice. You know, you don't get to you don't get to decide whether or not you're getting a bardic inspiration. You don't get to decide whether or not I use cutting words on you. It just happens. Mm -hmm. The bard's best able to do that on a moment to moment basis. The warlord, on the other hand, especially in the context of the level up playtest, is able to provide more people with more choices. Yeah. While you're conscious, any ally within range of your command... Do you want to use commanding presence? Do you want to use this free attack that's being granted to you? Would you like to apply this maneuver to it? Etc, mm -hmm. etc. Et this, this is the essence of this class. You are providing... You are making the rest of the game more tactical for the rest of your party if they choose to engage with it. Yeah, and I think that providing that in a class, saying you are able to, you are allowed to make this game more. If you're dissatisfied with our base level of things, you can increase it. You can basically double the number of choices you're going to be making in combat and the like, simply by by having one person in your party play this class. What a, what a clever solution. Mm-hmm. Now, the the um. Now, when I when I looked at daring assault, I had jo I had joked that it's for all intents and purposes, it's po it's um it's granting other people power attack, but it does fit the theme of the ga of the gambling general, which seems to be all about high risk, high reward tactics. Or yep. it, or grant grant you. You have to you have to weigh the fact that you can grant yourself advantages, but you're gonna grant, but there's gonna be risks with everything you do. Yeah, well, it's why I said like, yeah, this is this is like it matches with the theme. That's mm -hmm. that's what these people do is they deliver on theme with almost without fail. One failure, the ranger. Why would they do that? Mm -hmm. I'm I'm half kidding. I gotta go back and watch the ranger episode. I think. Mm -hmm. So there's some. There's got to be some reason that's still bugging me. Yeah, um, a lot of the stuff with I'd say for people who want for I'd say for people who want to focus on the maneuverability options that the warlord grants, 
they'd probably want they probably want to pick the peasant lieutenant subclass because that seems to be the approach that it's going with a lot of maneuverability and a lot of um a lot of a lot of tr a lot of trying to get people out trying to get people out of trouble when when they can yeah maneuverability mhm mm i actually there is one other ability that i highlighted that i would like to go over it's dig deeper you can take a bonus action to allow a creature to regain the use of an origin trait or class feature that would normally be regained by finishing a short rest. You can use this feature twice for a long rest. <laughs> I like that quite a bit. <laughs> See, it's, it's an 18th level ability, obviously very powerful, but uh, I like... I find I'm delighted that it made it into this playtest at all. Mm How -hmm. oh, cool. Uh, oh yeah, that's it. That's in um, the tactical commander, and that's in op. Oh, that is in tactical. Oh, mm -hmm. for some reason I read operations. Ah, oh, that's right. The header is not. I read operations leader as being the individual subclass. No, the th tactical commander is the third. Is the third the third um subclass, and it seems to focus on its t on its tactics die. Which can be used as a bonus die when some when someone's making an attack roll. Um, it's in some ways it's in some in some ways it is leaning a little bit into the maneuver die that the um, battlemaster had for for the um, fighter. Just a just a bit um, simplified. Um, the student of war ab ab ability, meh. It's you're get you're getting an you're getting an extra skill and an expert you're getting an extra extra t die and proficiency with a skill. Um, that's pretty much going to be a um, a whole filler thing. Like you're only pick you're only picking that to to grab a skill that you don't already have. Um, operations leader is a is a wall of text though. Um, yeah, we should probably we should probably stop skimming the. Thing I think we mostly got our got our piece in. Yeah, this is well. This is well developed class. Mm -hmm. This is very well developed. Uh, but I'd I'd say I'd say they I'd say they've certain. This is a this is a nice demonstration of 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 what we can of what we can see. Um, there are there once again there are a few issues and. I'd I'd say in this case more of the issues that we have are more are a consequence of constraints of the goal. Like you said before, they're trying to level up 5e, not make a whole new thing. So there are certain there are certain headaches that are just going to have to be dealt with. Um the mm -hmm. whole the rest economy as I've called it is a is a big one and the other one is some of is us we've had we've had plenty of we've had a few cases in this one where there are some abilities that we di that we didn't mind on paper. It's just where they were slotted in, where we weren't, where we weren't exactly um, sure about, and um, restrictions restrictions stacking. But I'd say a good chunk of those are are bad are bad design habits across the um, sandbox of Five E. Mm hmm. Um. But. Next week, next week will be it will be an opera. Well, we will unfortunately be be going back to to the to tenth to tenth level discussion. But it will be the return of the subclass hour, and it'll be a case of working my gimmick because next week is the adept, which is which despite that being an despite that being an unfamiliar sounding name for all intents and purposes next week is their answer to the monk oh boy <laughs> which means which means i'm going to have to i'm going to have to bring up how, i'm going to have to bring up some of the really dumb decisions with the third edition monk and why they and why they were the poster child for mad i e multiple ability dependency but that is a story for another time. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>